week, I think from Washington or something, college quarterback, freshman quarterback, just took his own life. There's a lot of people that are very disappointed with their lives. And, you know, you spend your entire life chasing a dream, building a certain kind of life, and in the end you're just disappointed. And It's not what you expected, not what you expected at all. Back in 1996, John Crowther's, I think that's how you say his name, John Crockers, realized his lifelong dream, and that was to climb Mount Everest. On the trip down from Mount Everest, 12 of the team members that went with him died, and so the trip became memorable for those 12 deaths more than the fact that they made it to the top. But, but, but Crocker recalls what it was like when he reached the summit of the mountain. He said, I have one foot in Nepal, and I have one foot in China, and I'm here, and I know it's going to be a breathtaking moment, and I'm just too exhausted to care. And I snap four or five photos, he says, and I head down. He said, I spent five minutes at the rooftop of the world. And kind of like the Paris effect again, it just wasn't everything that he expected it to be. By the time he got there, he was too exhausted to enjoy it. And that takes me to another sad irony. There's, there's a sad irony. Ever watch those movies, you know, where there's a, they're in a boat and the boat gets shipwrecked at sea? And if there's no lifeboat, what happens? Well, they end up clinging to what? They end up clinging to the pieces of their broken boat. I thought, what a picture of so many people's lives. Really, we end up clinging to the very things in life that have failed us. We pursue money, we pursue our career, we pursue all kinds of things, and and those things fail us and let us down, and yet we end up clinging to those very things that have failed us. Some people make lots of money, conquer their career, acquire the latest toys, build the biggest house, take the most exotic vacations, or climb the highest mountains, and they get to the top and they're just disappointed. And some people climb, you know, they climb the mountain and they get to the top and they're disappointed. So you know what they think? Well, I just need to climb a higher mountain. (laughs) But that doesn't work. It really doesn't work because you know you have to understand and that Crocker didn't understand. It's not about reaching the top of the mountain. It's about knowing the one and traveling with the one who created the mountain. That's what it's all about. That's the key to it all. And so there's the sad irony that we cling to the very things in life that have, has failed us. Today we are the church and we want to talk about abundant life. We want to talk about abundant life and we've been talking the last couple of weeks about some things that pertain to our church. We're talking about what it means to be the church. The goal of this is eventually, I think in March, we're going to have a massive membership Sunday and we can all become official members. Some of you did that maybe 20 or 30 years ago here at the church. It's been a long time since we actually had membership and so we're going to identify exactly who is a member Who isn't? If you want to be a member, if you know Christ, you can be a member of, if you're a member of God's church, you can be a member of our church. It's that simple. So, but here's the thing. Here's the caption for our church. We believe this is how it works. That uncompromising truth plus radical grace equals abundant life. And I've been preaching this the last couple of years now. This, this same theme, at least once a year. We believe you can't compromise the truth. We believe you have to be radical in your grace. That is the gospel. The gospel is a truth that can't be compromised. It is a grace that is more radical than we can even imagine. And it leads to the abundant life. Today we want to talk about the abundant life. John 10.10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And there's two reasons Jesus came in that verse. Did you see him? He says, I have come that they may have life, that's eternal life, that is spiritual life, that is the Christ life, that is our salvation. Christ came so that you could be positionally in him, saved, redeemed, spend eternity in heaven. But he also came for for what? That we may have life and that we may have that life in abundance. That we may may know the abundant life. That's the other reason Christ came. So it's important to understand these two reasons. And, and what the abundant life really is, it's the measured life. It's, it's the life in measure. What do I mean by that? I mean this, okay? So when, when you are saved, Christ came so you could have life, so you could be saved and redeemed and go to heaven when you die. And one day we're going to go to heaven and we're going to be in the presence of Christ for all eternity. And you know what the abundant life is? It, is? it is enjoying the eternal life in heaven here on earth. And the more that you can experience what's coming in heaven here on earth in your relationship with Christ... That's the abundant life. And it it, it comes to us in greater and greater and in greater measure. In fact, here's the question this morning, thinking thinking about this whole thing of abundant life. The reality is, and this is why it's so important, why is it so important that we talk about abundant life? You might think, well, we've, we got that down. We know Christ and we understand. You talk to us about abundant life all the time. The reason it's so important that we understand abundant life and where it comes from and how we can have more of it because the abundant life is a life in measure. You can have 
more abundance in your life with Christ. That's the point. You may know a little bit of abundant life, but you can know more and you can have more in your relationship with Christ. The reason it's so important is this. The question is simply this. um, Do people see the abundant life in me? Because it is our job as the church to model what it means to be a Christian, what it means to know the abundant life. I wonder how many people today don't look at Christians and think, well, I don't want to be a Christian if that's what a Christian is. I don't want, they're exhausted, man. They're stressed out, they're exhausted, they're angry. They're, you know, how, how can we model for them what it means to live the abundant life? We're going to look at it today. We're going to see today very clearly how you can know more abundance in your life with Christ. It's just going to be a very simplistic and powerful thing. And so here's today's big idea. We'll start right here. The abundant life is clinging to the Christ life. Clinging to the Christ life in greater and greater measure. And growing in the Christ life to greater and greater maturity. That's what the abundant life is. And we will look at exactly what that means in a little more detail as we go forward. In fact, there are really two directions today to to living the abundant life. Two directions. We'll look at the first direction That'll make most of, take most of our time and then we'll look at the second direction in response. But here's the, the first direction then. If you want to know how to live the abundant life, you want to know more of the, the, the life of Christ in abundance, in greater measurement, it starts right here. The abundant life is this. The abundant life is uh, the fact that I am in Christ. It's my position in Christ. When we are saved, the moment we are saved, the moment we trust Christ and are redeemed and we accept his forgiveness we are placed into Christ. Here's what it says, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that's your position. He is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Another passage right here, Romans 6, 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ... We have been spiritually baptized into Christ Jesus. We were baptized into Christ Jesus. We're baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into his death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. The minute we trust Christ as our Savior, that very instant we are baptized into Christ. We are now in Christ. That's our position. That is our position. Now, the thing is, there's a difference between our position, the positional side of our salvation and the practical side of our salvation and the the abundant life. See what, what I was saying earlier? I am saved. That's my life. That's my position in Christ. The abundance is the practical side. It's how much I live in and live out that Christ life in practical terms. Let me give you a great illustration, okay? This morning... You are all positionally in this church building. We are all here, right? We are in church today, right? Hallelujah, we're in church. But, you can be in church, but how well do you engage with the singing? How how well do you respond to the lyrics that we sing? How, How tuned in are you when we pray? When we read scripture, when you hear the message, how much do you absorb it and take it into yourself? See, you can be in church, but not really be in church. And I've had people tell me that before. You know, they've talked about that to me before. Coming to church, you know, and you got so many things on your mind. That, you know, you're, you're thinking about so many other th- problems in your life. You're in church, but you're not really there. You're not really engaged. That's the reality. You can be in church and not really be in church. You can be in Christ, but not really be in Christ because you're really not engaging Him. And you're really not living within that reality. So here, let me give you this morning another illustration. And then I'm going to give you... Three examples of what it means to be in Christ in a more practical sense. But think about this. Think about being in Christ from seven different levels this morning. Here it is. I think I got to, yes, I do here. Think about this. You can be, you can be uh, in Christ. You can have a toe in the water. You can, you can, be, you can jump in with two, with two feet. You can jump in with both feet. I can be knee deep in the water with Christ. I can be up to my waist high. I can be up to my neck. Well, when you think about where you are with Christ today, do I have a toe in the water? Am I just kind of, I'm just kind of testing out what it means to really surrender to Christ? Or, you know, am I knee deep with Jesus? Am I up to my neck with Christ today? That's the question. That's the 
question there that we can think about. And I'll give you three ways that you can go deeper, that you can get your toe maybe a little more submerged. You can get in with both feet or maybe you can be knee deep or waist high. Here's what you need to do. Three things. One, the abundant life is abiding in Christ intimately. It's abiding in Christ intimately. Jesus created us so we could have a relationship with him, so we could be in fellowship with him. That's the simple reality. That's why God made us. God did not need you. He wanted you. It's that simple. God did not need you. He wanted you. Now, here's what's so amazing, though, is that when God created you, God created you so that you would need him. That without him, your life will be incomplete. Your life will not know the abundance it can know that, that it will know when you live in fellowship with him. God doesn't need you, but he created you to need him. And the reality is, the simple fact is, we will never find the abundant life apart from Christ. We never will. So the more I abide in Christ, the more I can experience the abundant life. Now, I found a few interesting verses this week. You know, it's amazing, you know, reading through the Bible and you think, well, I never saw that verse before. Or it's not so much the verse, actually, in this case, that's a word. There's a word that I found really fascinating. Let me show it to you. It's in Deuteronomy. Uh, there's four or five times in the Old Testament you can find this, this, uh, this word. You shall follow the Lord your God and fear him. You shall keep his commandments, listen to his voice, serve him, and cling to him. I would circle that word cling this morning. I would just circle it on your heart. Cling to him. We see this also over in Joshua 22. Be very careful to observe the commandments and the law that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and to cling to him and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. What, what a thing. So Jesus is te- or God is telling the Israelites, you got, you've got the law and you need to serve me and you need to cling to your God. Now, that word cling, you know where that Hebrew word is first found in the Bible? You know what that Hebrew word is? Really an interesting word here. It is the word uh, um, devak. Devak in the Greek. And why is this word significant? You know the first place you find this word in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Listen to this. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast or be joined, bond, cleave, or cling to his wife and they shall become one flesh. So that's what he's telling them there just as a husband and wife gets, gets married and they become one. You know how painful divorce is? And I'm sure a lot of you have, have experienced that. No, there's great pain in divorce. There really is. And thankfully, there is enough of God's grace to cover that reality in life. God knew people would go through divorce, and there's plenty of grace to cover, uh, plenty of grace to cover the, the times we go through divorce. And I don't say this to, to take divorce lightly, just the opposite, though. Anybody who's been through it knows that divorce can be painful because the Bible paints a picture that, that, that's like two pieces of wood that are glued together and when you rip them apart, it hurts, it's painful. It splinters, it, it hurts a lot, of, a, a lot of people. But here's the thing. So we're supposed to cling today just as two people get married and become one. We're supposed to cling to one another. We're supposed to be that close, that intimately connected to Christ. Uh, Here's what it is. God wants us to cling to him as tightly as he is clinging to us. And let me just tell you something this morning. There's this doctrine people struggle with. It's called the doctrine of eternal security. It's this reality that once you're saved, you're always saved. And you can never lose your salvation. Nothing can ever take away your salvation. You can be saved and you can walk away from God, but God will never walk away from you. And some people struggle with that. I'm just here to tell you right here, God is clinging to you. He wants you to cling to him and he is clinging to you and he will never divorce you. That's the one way to look about your relationship with Christ. He will never let you go. You, you, you know, you may walk away on him, but he will never walk away on you. God wants us to cling to him as tightly as he is clinging to us. New Testament, John 15. Here's how it describes the idea of abiding in Christ in the New Testament. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes it that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am in Christ, that's my position. But abiding there is a choice I make. Do I live 
in that position. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Two things in that little passage there. I can do nothing apart from Christ. If I'm not abiding, if I'm not relying on the, if I'm not relying on the vine for the source of my strength and energy, I can do nothing of any spiritual or eternal value. I will not know the abundant life. At the same time, notice the different levels of bearing fruit. I can bear fruit. I can bear more fruit. And there in verse 5, I can bear much fruit. The more that I abide in Christ, the more fruit that I can bear. There's a measurement there of, of going from bearing fruit to bearing more fruit to bearing much fruit. The more that I abide with Christ, the more I am intimately connected to Him, the more I will know the abundant life. That's the simple lesson. That means spending time with him, spending time with him in his word, spending time in worship. It means just being consumed with Christ. It's, it's the sentiments of what we sang earlier today. Just give me Jesus. You can have the whole world. All I, all I need is Christ. He is everything that I need. Everything I am longing for. Actor, um, actor Andrew Garfield, who plays a priest in uh, Martin Scorsese's adaption of the movie Silence, told an interviewer about his religious views. Films were really my church, Garfield said. This is where I felt soothed. This is where I felt most myself. But in preparation for the film, Garfield practiced something called the spiritual exercise of Ignatius. Although it is a Roman Catholic spiritual process, it is rich in reading the Bible, especially the four Gospels. We do not know if Garfield actually committed his life to Jesus Christ, but he certainly was moved and changed by what seemed to be at least an introduction to the person of Jesus. Here's what Garfield said. What was really easy was falling in love with this person, was falling in love with Jesus Christ. That was the most surprising thing. I felt so bad for Jesus and angry on his behalf when I finally did meet him because everyone has given him such a bad name. So many people have given him such a horrible name and he has been used for so many dark things. And like many of us, beneath this longing, he carried a deep fear, a fear that he wasn't good enough, Garfield continued. The main thing I wanted to heal that I brought to Jesus was this feeling of not enoughness, this feeling, this fear of of the forever longing for the perfect expression of this thing that is inside each of us. That wound of not enoughness, that wound of feeling like what I have to offer is never enough. And he brought that to Christ. And I'm here to tell you that's, whether this person got saved or not, he, he realized a profound truth. You need to bring your not enoughness to Christ. He is more than enough. In all the ways you think you don't measure up, in all the ways you think you have failed, in all of the sins and burdens that you carry around, come to Christ. He is more than enough. You need to abide in Him intimately. That's where the abundant life in Christ is found. It starts there. Let me give you a second example, second way, and that's trusting in Christ obediently. Trusting in Christ will be, I was thinking, you know, so talking about trust today, what do we do to talk about trust? Here's what I want to talk to you about today. Um, and again, remember we're thinking about, do I have a toe in the water? Am I knee deep? Am I waist high? Am I up to my neck? How much am I in with Christ this morning? I was thinking about, I was thinking about our money today. You know, I was really thinking this week about this. I have some cool things to say here. And it's true, pastors don't like to bring up the issue of money. It's such a personal thing. People feel guilty, uncomfortable. They squirm when you start talking about their money. Truth is, money should never make us feel that way. So here's what I gotta tell you, you know. Since we came to the church a year ago, me and Dan were talking about this and he was looking at our financial statements where we were a year ago and last year we moved and we emptied out a lot, you know, our building fund, bought the new building, moved in here. I mean, it's been an expensive year for the church. You know what's amazing? I think he said we have more in our accounts today than we did a year ago. We, we've, we've just had some phenomenal gifts and offerings. God has blessed our church, and you'll see it next week in the congregation meeting. God has blessed our church beyond, I think, all of our wildest dreams. We, we stepped out in faith. We trusted Him, and God just came along and did amazing, amazing things. I was thinking, you know, it's kind of like, you know, those pledge drives where they say, you know, if, um, if you give $100, we have a matching donor, and they'll double that. 
So your gift becomes $200. And they do these things to entice you to give, you know. It's like, give your money now and it'll be doubled. It'll be worth twice as much. I would say anybody that's given in the last year of the church, it's like God came along and just doubled your gift. It's like he gave twice as much. God just blessed our church in profound ways. He really did. And he did it in response to our faithfulness and our stepping out in faith. Here's the thing about trusting God obediently. It comes back to our finances. One of the areas where our faith and obedience is most tested is in the area of our giving. We're all called to be givers. We're all called to support God's work. We're all called to be a part of it. And what's really cool is I can stand up here to sit today and say, you know what, I'm not saying this because the church needs your money. Church doesn't need your money. God doesn't need your money. God's got all the money in the world. God doesn't need you to give. You know who, you know who needs you to give? You need you to give. Talking about talking to my brother last night. My brother's got a pretty big business. Been very successful in the last probably 10 years. He was talking to me the other night. We went out and we were talking. He was talking about giving. And when he was really profoundly changed in the area of giving, how radically it affected his life. His church went through a building drive and they got into giving and it just totally transformed his attitude and his life. I'm not saying you're going to get rich if you give to God. That's not the point. I'm just saying something changes in us when we learn to be givers, when we learn to consistently give every week. If you've developed the discipline of giving, let me just tell you, I think you know the blessing of that. Here's a very simple and straightforward. So how much do I give? Here's the most simple, straightforward verse on it to know about giving. Three verses. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Verse 7, each one must give, how much? As he has decided in his heart. And under grace today, we're not under law, but we're under grace. We all decide in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. We decide in our heart how much we're to give. How, How do you decide that? By intimately abiding with Christ. He'll tell you. Stay close to Christ. He'll tell you what he wants you to give. And, um, and then verse 8, all, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Notice that word abound. There, there is something about the abundant life that is found in giving, being a giver. You develop being a giver. You develop, again, how much are you in with God, trusting God. The more you trust Him with every area of your life, your finances, everything, you're going to know more abundance in your life you will be blown away what what it'll do to you. And I can say that personally. I've learned that over my lifetime. Even over my time here, in the last 13 years of the church, God's made me more of a giver. And it has changed me in profound ways. So I say that today, because if you want the abundant life, I was going to tell you the truth, you got to trust God. And, and maybe it's money, maybe not, maybe for you it's not money, maybe it's a relationship, maybe there's something else where you need to trust God today. But we need to trust God obediently and um, when you do that, it will lead to the abundant life. Let me give you one last example. The abundant life is surrendering to Christ completely. It is surrendering to Christ completely. Um, <clears throat> what does that mean? What does it mean to surrender to Christ completely? One way to grasp it is to look at it through the life of Christ. You see, Jesus is the ultimate example of surrender. The Bible says the gospel was the greatest act of surrender. The Bible says that the gospel, that Christ's death on the cross, that Jesus, no one took Jesus' life from him. He willingly surrendered it. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life. This is John 10. This is shortly after he tells us that he came to bring eternal life. And he's talking here about his relationship as the sheep with the shepherd. And he says, for this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. You know, the reality is if no one had crucified Christ, if no one had put him on the cross, he would have put himself there because we needed him to be crucified for our sins. Now, the reality is we did put him there. We did put him there with our sins, but, I mean, people did literally put him there. But in the end, he laid down his life willingly. He surrendered And to surrender to God, we surrender, I guess in some ways we're surrendering to God's will. What is God's will for my life? What does God want to do with my life? It's His life, and I surrender my life to His will. At the same time, I surrender my life to God's power. I surrender my life to God's power. It's kind of like, if you can just think this morning, that 
you know, you're in life, and, and let's just use this as an illustration. Let's just say, okay, <clears throat> there's a task in front of me, and there's something that I need to do, you know, and I need to come, and I need to do this task. And so what I do is, you know, I, I come before the task, and then I surrender to Christ, and I say, you know what? You do it. You do whatever that task is, and I surrender to Christ, and I have Christ step up and do it. And all I am is the instrument. All I am is the vessel. Let me give you some examples this morning of, of how we can surrender to Christ. Loving my spouse. Sometimes they're hard to love, right? Sometimes I'm hard to love. We're all hard to love sometimes. Witnessing to my neighbor, going on that mission trip, serving that homeless person, reaching out to that single mom, training my children, getting to know that new person, responding in humility to a coworker or boss apologizing for a wrong, forgiving a hurt, taking up a ministry at a church, and we could go on and on. There are all kinds of tasks and opportunities and things we come before, and I can simply surrender and say, I'm going to surrender my life to Christ. And here's what it looks like in the scriptures, Romans 6, 12. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires, but... Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master, for you are no longer, you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God. I love verse 14. You live under the freedom of God's grace. That's the abundant life. You want the abundant life? You live under the freedom of God's grace. How do you do it? You don't let your body be used for sin. You surrender yourselves to be an instrument of righteousness so that God can do all those tasks. So you come to a task and you say, Lord, you do it. And you just use me and I'll be your hands and I'll be your feet and you do it. And you love my wife and you reach out to my neighbor and you help me show humility at work and whatever it might be. And you just let Christ use you for his grace and for his glory. That is the abundant life. That is the abundant life. The abundant life. It's abiding in Christ intimately. It's trusting in Christ obediently. It's surrendering to Christ completely. And the question is, do you have a toe in the water? Have you jumped in with both feet? Are you knee deep? Are you waist high? Are you up to your neck in Christ? How deep have you gone with Jesus? The deeper you go, the more abundant your life is going to be. So that's the first direction. Now we're going to deal very quickly with the second direction when we think about the, this life. The abundant life is the fact that I am in Christ. Positionally, I am in Christ. I, just as I'm in church, but I can be in church, but then I can really be in church. And I can really be in the service. So I'm in Christ, but then I can really be in Christ. And I can live in that reality. Here's the second direction. It's this. The abundant life is this. It's that Christ is in me. Christ is in me. It's this two-way street. And we read it earlier, and maybe you caught it when we read it. Maybe some of you thought, oh, I know where he's going. John 15, 3 and 4, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. So I am in Christ and Christ is in me. And the second direction of knowing an abundant life is, is knowing this reality again that Christ is in me and it's growing that Christ life to greater and greater maturity. So we talk about being in Christ to greater and greater measure and then we talk about growing Christ in us to greater and greater maturity. Christ lives in me. He just, he's here. He will never leave me. He will never divorce me. He will never unadopt me. He will never let go of me. He will cling to me forever. But the reality is Christ is in me and I can grow him in me and I can learn to let him live through me. Here's a great passage. Oh, again, here's another one. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he, it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. There's a, a relationship between the fact that Christ, that I am in Christ and that Christ is in me. Look at 2 Corinthians 4. Great passage. But we have this treasure, writes Paul, in jars of clay. What's the treasure? The treasure is Christ. It's the Christ life. Jesus Christ is the treasure. He is the thing worth pursuing. 
We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us but life in you and understand what Paul's saying is he went out and did the ministry and he suffered for it he was beaten down for it it caused him physical pain and suffering and persecution and he he lost friends and it, it affected him in all kinds of ways and Paul says you know what I don't care though that's the abundant life because the abundant life is when people see Christ in me when through the brokenness of my life, the brokenness of a shattered life, people see the glory of God. Man, what can be more abundant than that? What can be more meaningful than that? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. We are jars of clay. We are the instruments of righteousness and we surrender to let Christ simply use us and live through us. Let me give you five quick snapshots of what this looks like in our life of what it looks like when Christ shines through our own broken jars of clay. How about the abundant life is peace in times of stress? We live in a stress-filled world. We have all kinds of stress that come at us from all kinds of angles. And you know what? If you know Christ as your Savior, if you are in Christ and Christ is in you, you can, you can know greater and greater abundance and you can know greater and greater peace in those times of incredible stress. A peace that people will look at you and say, I don't understand how you can be how you can have such peace. I don't, I don't get it. How about joy in times of sorrow? Have you ever experienced a deep and abiding joy even when you were in pain? Sometimes it is in our pain that we can end up feeling the closest to Christ. In fact, I'll say something really radical here. I think when Jesus hung on the cross, when he hung on the cross and suffered the crucifixion for you and I, I believe on the cross, he experienced joy. I really do. And that might sound really radical. Let me tell you why I think he experienced joy. There are two reasons why. One, the first one is based on this. There, and I've, I've taught on this many times, but there's this view, um, and, and I think it's shifting now. People are starting to see a, a different way of this. But there's this view that when Christ hung on the cross, that God the Father, because he was bearing all the sins, that God turned away and God looked away from him and God abandoned him on the cross all alone. He left him there on the cross uh, until he paid for the price of sin and you know, then they were reunited. And so there's this thought that God turned away and stopped looking at Christ when he was on the cross. And I don't believe that's true. I believe what it is is that Christ felt like God abandoned him you ever feel like God abandoned you? You ever feel like God just walked out on you and God left you alone? It's like, God, where are you? He didn't. He never will. He's clinging to you. It might, it might feel that way sometime in our experiences, but he's never going to leave you or forsake you. And when Christ hung on the cross, he didn't leave him or forsake him or turn his back on him. He was fully engaged. Jesus paid the price for our sins. In fact, here's a verse. I don't think I've ever read this verse or used this verse in this way. Let me show you a verse. This is the New American Standard Bible. King James... Uh, several other translations quote this the same way. It's probably the most literal translation of this. It, listen, to, listen to where God was when Jesus was on the cross. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. When Christ hung on the cross and paid the price for our sins, God and Jesus were still one. He was still in Christ. But he paid the price for our sins. I don't think we can fully comprehend how that works. But the reality is there's incredible joy we can have in times of sorrow. And I think that joy comes from being feeling a closeness with Christ even in the midst of our suffering and our pain. Hebrews 12, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. We have an example, verse 2, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Christ on the cross, there was just this joy. He knew what the cross meant. He knew it was on the other side of the cross. He knew there was joy in front of him. 
that this was going to allow us to, Galatians 6, walk in eternal freedom. He knew what the cross meant and so it gave him great joy. There is also the abundant life in the sense that there is hope in times of despair. We live in a world of despair. We live in a world of, of trying times and there's despair all around us and yet we can have an incredible hope. Let me give you one last passage this morning. One of my favorite passages is Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body that is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. Look at verse 26. The mystery hidden for ages and generations but now revealed to his saints, to them God shows to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is what? It is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works in me. There is a hope in Christ that transcends the despair all around us. Christ in me, the hope of glory, the hope of eternity, but the hope today that I can know in great measure because I am in him and because he is in me. Has life beaten you down and wore you out? Well, you know, you can know this as well. Here's my, the abundant life is strength in times of weakness. Strength in times of weakness. And we just read verse 29 again. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works in me. There is a strength in our times of weakness. That again, it just, people will look and say, boy, I don't know where you get it from. Where do you get that peace and that hope and that joy and that strength? And I just don't get it, but there is a strength in our times of weakness. Paul said it, when I am weak, then I am strong. Why? Because his strength wasn't his own. His strength came from Christ. And I just love this verse. I toil, struggling how? With all his energy. Isn't that great? I toil, yeah, I work hard, but I don't use my own energy. I use the energy that God gives to me that he powerfully works through me. And I accomplish things I could never accomplish on my own. Why? Because I am abiding in Christ. I am clinging to Christ. In the classic French film, Jean de Florte, townspeople in a small village in Provence, France, conspire against a local landowner named named, uh, uh, Jean, who has just inherited a plot of land. They want to force Jean's little farm to fail so they can possess the land. The land receives only scant rainfall, so they sneak onto his property and plug a healthy system, cementing it shut and covering it with dirt. John does not know about the nearby spring, but he knows of another, more distant water supply over a mile away. He initially makes progress, but eventually getting the water and dragging it from the distant spring becomes a back-breaking experience. Sadly, he never discovers that he already has an inexhaustible supply of water underground but nearby. And I'm telling you, that describes a lot of Christians today who work really hard at their Christian life, who struggle really hard and just don't realize that there is this internal supply of energy and power and joy and hope and peace because Christ is in us. I'm in Christ and Christ is in me. And... and there's just this energy we can know. And most, too often, sadly enough, people just don't know that they have that energy within them. And then finally, one last example, the abundant life is forgiveness in times of hurt. There's times when we need to forgive people that have hurt us and wronged us. And you know what? I'm telling you, you can do that in Christ. Christ is in you. He is all the forgiveness you will ever need. There is nothing beyond your ability to forgive someone for what they have done to you. The abundant life. There's freedom. We can become the instruments of forgiveness. The instruments of forgiveness. Let me give you a couple of observations this morning. We're going to wrap this up here. And again, the question is, how deep am I in with Jesus? Do I have a toe in the water? Have I jumped in with both feet? Am I uh, knee deep in the water? Uh, Maybe I am uh, waist high. Maybe I'm up to my neck. 
Possibly, you know what? How about if we're all in over our head? How about that? Let's, I'm just in over my head with Jesus today. I'm just, I'm just in over my head, man. It is just well beyond me. How deep have you gone this morning with Christ? How deep have you gone with Jesus? Let me give you a couple of observations here this morning. Number one, the deeper I am in with Jesus, the more abundant my life will be. The deeper I am in with Jesus, the more abundant my life is going to be. It's that simple. The reality is there. The the more I am in Christ, the more Christ is in me. Yes, positionally I'm in Christ, positionally he's in me, but the more I am in Christ, the more Christ is going to be in me. And then the second observation is this, the abundant life overflows to others. Just does. The abundant life overflows to those around us. So when I have peace and when I have joy and when I have hope, And when I have abundance of forgiveness, when I have all these things in my life, that overflows to the people. They're the blessing. And people look at it and say, yeah, that's the kind of life I want. I want that kind of abundant life. Let me give you an illustration here this morning as I close. And I was thinking this week how to do this. And I don't know if I ever did anything similar to this or not. I may have in the past. Um, Let's see if I can pull this up a little closer without splashing everything everywhere. So the question this morning is, how deep am I in with Jesus today? No, this is not SpongeBob, by the way. But but seriously, so I I thought of putting arms and legs on him, but I'm not, not that creative. But, you know, I can have a foot in the water Do I have a foot in the water today with Jesus? Or maybe I got in with both feet, or maybe I'm waist high with with Christ, or maybe, you know, how deep have you gone with Christ? See, the more you're in Christ, uh, well, the more Christ is going to be in you. Are you in over your head with Jesus today? Are you abiding in, in, in Him intimately? Are you trusting Him obediently? Are you surrendering to Him completely? You see what happens when I am in Christ... Christ is in me. That's the beauty of it. That's how it works. And the more that I'm in Christ, the more I abide and the more that I trust and the more that I surrender. I don't know what it looks like in your life, but the more you're in Christ, the more Christ is in you and the more you will overflow into the lives of other people. Let's close in prayer and we're going to sing one last song this morning. Let's bow our heads. Father God, I just thank you for the abundant life. I thank you that you have given it to me that I understand it to some degree. But I understand what I said today in my own life, that the abundant life comes in greater and greater measure. And I know there's areas in my life where I just don't know the abundance of you that I want to. And I'm sure that is true for every one of us in this room today. And I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what you said. Here's what your Holy Spirit does. Your Holy Spirit goes to each of us and it talks to us and says, you need to abide with me here or trust with me here or surrender to me here. And all of us have heard you in different ways today. And I just pray for each of us, Lord, that we would listen to that still small voice because seriously, that is how we're going to know the abundant life. And the more that we're in with you, the more that you are in us and the more hope and joy and peace and love and grace and beauty and wonder and that will fill our life. So I lift that up to you today. Encourage each of us to walk out these doors and know how we can have more of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let's sing this last song together. Praise, do you want to come down and sing with me? You can. And uh, what a great song to end on today. Um, Great song of commitment.